Good evening. I normally say welcome to all our parents and community, but I'll say welcome to the forest. <laughs> Let the record reflect this is a regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. Today is Monday, June the 8th, 2020. Time is now 7 p.m. At this time, I call our meeting to order and declare that we have a quorum of the trustees present. This evening, Mr. Mullinex will lead us in the pledges, and Mr. Rector will lead us in the invocation. Everybody, please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are the creator and sustainer of life. Lord, we come before you praying for this nation in lieu of all the events taking place right now. Lord, I pray that you would put love back in our hearts and our minds so that we would love one another and have respect and compassion for each other. We know that we belong to you. Help us come back together with peace and love for each other. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless us and keep us safe as we face the COVID-19 epidemic. And we pray that you will bless us now as we begin this meeting. And we ask all that we ask in the most precious name of Jesus Christ. For his sake we do pray. Amen. Amen. Good Thank you, John and David. Agenda item number two is the public testament. We move on to agenda item number three, which is the square again an appointment to the board of the new trustee. Uh, the swearing in originally appointed board member Mr. Flores. At this time, I will ask Ms. Stansberry to come up and take the square in. Mr. Flores, come up also. Right here in the center of the room. So as you go through, you'll see that I 
as I move through the meeting, it will move you through the meeting. So you can send the next sign up to the next item, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you go to any other item in the meeting while you're doing the follow the leader, it will take you off from following the person leading the meeting. So, um, for example, you want to go look at an attachment. Let's say you wanted to look at our requirements. It'll take you off. Oops, that's on screen. It'll take you off. Um, it turns off that little follow the leader right there. It turns that off. Anytime you want to go back to where the leader is, you just click that button, and it'll take you back to where we are. Um, anytime that I, as the meeting navigator, navigate to a page or an attachment, it will open up that attachment for everyone so that it will all be able to see it at the same time. But that's pretty much it as far as a board member. You can go to this format where you're going through and navigating the meeting at any time, um, and it won't mess up as, as far as us conducting the action. You can move at it this way. Um, if you go here to add a note, and you add notes, this is just like writing on a notepad, but it's just saved here to this so at, at any later date, you want to go back and look at your notes that you made during this meeting, it saves it. But it's only viewable to you. And there's no keyboard to that method. It's like finger no, if you writing. click on it, if you click on it, it um, if you're using it on a like an iPad, it'll bring it up, the keyboard on the bottom. Oh, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that also on the iPad, and this is something we discovered earlier today, if you have it in the um, viewing where it is a portrait, you, you can't see this right here, this Agenda here on the side. It just shows you the agenda item we're on. If you turn it to landscape, turn your ad pad sideways, it'll show this this way. So if you have any questions. If not, you can always email me, call me, anything. Because I know it's new software, it's totally different, but if you need any help with anything, just let me know. The latest priest. But right now, the easiest thing to do, put that follow over. Okay. Anybody have any questions? We'll get used to it, we'll become pros. <laughs> Instead of numerical grades. 
at the high school level, we continue to use numerical grades due to um, the GPA piece that's there due to credit, non-credit for courses. So what we're looking at is a matrix where we were looking at the pass and incomplete portion to determine what you see on the screen in the board book. So when you look at Falk Elementary, you'll see that promoted, we have per per percentages across the way there. And if you look back at the sheet I gave you, promoted is passing and engaged. That's what that meant. What we looked at was the first to the fourth six weeks, we averaged their grade, that was before they got out for spring break, we averaged to see whether they were passing or not passing within campus instruction. Then we took that and then we looked at what they had done during the COVID distance learning. And if they had been passing at that time before spring break, and then after coming back, if they had been engaged during distance learning, they were promoted. And you see here that parent contact was on the report card with the promotion piece. So that gives you how we came up with those percentages of students that were passing and totally engaged in the process. Then we had some students that were engaged somewhat, not very much, um, maybe not even at all. Um, so you'll see promoted with monitoring. These are students that passed the first through the four six weeks, but were unengaged or only partially engaged during the distance learning, or the student was engaged but struggled significantly due to that platform and not having the access to the classroom teacher as they normally do. So a committee then took and looked at that and said, okay, they're passing, uh, and because um, we had some students that were doing really, really well um, in class, but once the distance learning occurred, we saw a major drop off in their ability to get things in. Some had family circumstances that were preventing it. So there were an array of reasons why the distance learning was not working very well for them. So the committee looked at if this child uh, had shown um, that they had the knowledge and the ability at the grade level they were in to be able to perform at the next grade level based on the fact that they were passing at a good rate uh, before they got out uh, at spring break. So those students were promoted with monitoring. The reason we put monitoring is because they were not engaged at all or very little or did not do well with the distance learning. Our fear is that there might still be a, a learning slide that has occurred, even though they had been doing well before. So they will be put on a monitoring list so that the teachers are there to provide support, encouragement, and close up any gaps very quickly that might have occurred that we will know once they return to us. But the committee, the, uh, any students that met this criteria, it's because the performance they had up to that point was very good and everyone felt very confident that the student will be successful. And then you'll see that we have those percentages there. So when you look at promoted and promoted with monitoring, in order to find your truly passing rate, you would have to uh, average those two together. So when you look at Falk Elementary, promoted was 93%, promoted with monitoring is 7%. Averaging, putting that together, that's 100% of those students at pre-K were promoted. So we had none placed with remediation or retained. Then if you flip to the back, you'll see placed with remediation. This are, these are students that failed the first through four six weeks average, when we averaged everything together. They were engaged or unengaged with distance learning. They basically looked at, the decision was made by a committee. They looked at that the passing rate, may, I mean the failing rate might have been, um, they have certain reasons for why they were failing. They felt like they, uh, the failing rate may not have been very high, uh, or the average was uh, just right there. Um, and looking at each student individually, you remember we talked about how we were going to consider each child individually. We were not going to lump them together. We were going to look at what we felt like they can handle. 
So the committee looked at them very carefully and also had a, a conference with the parents, contact with them to discuss their child. And there were students that were placed into the next grade level because based off of the documentation that they had before we had COVID and into COVID, they felt like this child does have um, a baseline of um, knowledge to enable them to go on into the next grade level, but they will need remediation. So they will receive remediation immediately upon arrival to the new school year so that we can close the gaps, shore them up, and help ensure that they will be successful. So summer school does not, these children don't fall into a summer school setting? Not these for K through eight, pre-K through eight. If we had a summer school, we could have done something like that. We chose not to do summer school because of um, basically the morale uh, issue that we were having with our teachers and our families. Everyone was just tired. They, it was, this was a very stressful time. So we felt like the emotional needs of our families uh, and our teachers were much more important at this point. It also gives us time to take a step back and prepare for whatever we're going to need to do for the fall. And I'll be discussing that here in a little bit, which is quite intense. Um, so these students, yes, they could have had summer school, but we've chosen, as you'll see, to start school earlier, have remediation placed when they return. We're gonna go into some of that here, here uh, momentarily, to provide these students what they need. Because there's some students that they, they may have not fared well for certain things, and they were kind of up and down, up and down, and they were just right there. And if we'd had them, it, it probably was like if we'd had them for the spring, the committee probably saw that we would have had them over the hump. But because we didn't have them for the spring to elevate their average, those students, you know, fell right in a gray area that after much consideration, they determined that was the best placement for them. Just well, I just, I'm sorry. I, I see that the second grade, which was already a transition year for them, going from the one school to the new school. Now they're going to another school next year in third grade, and third grade always being problematic for <laughs> scoring purposes. They've missed half, you know, a good two, two and a half months of a prime major part of their learning, and at the highest percentage that we're, we're, we're putting in remediation. Re yes. But, that's kind of concerning that are we are we going to add staff to keep or third grade going to be really amped up to be able to manage that's we, a high level of students well 13 percent is i should have given you the actual numbers that's not it that's not that many students i, I can get those for you i apologize but the remediation we, is nine percent of what of, of guess like this oh i'm sorry nine percent the nine percent is a small per, that's that's still a small percentage nine percent of uh hundred and 30 yeah. students, I'm a mathematician. So I mean, I, yes, I understand your concern, but it's a small amount of students. But remember, they were considered that they do have a baseline of academic progress that they feel like with remediation, they should be fine. Just a question. On the place with remediation we had talked about, ensuring that we were having those meetings with the families. Did we actually physically meet with them or were those done over the phone? More than likely phone, um, Zoom meetings, there was an array. I mean, they did it by various depending on the families. And we have documentation for Oh, yes. And then we have our retained. Uh, this student failed the first through four six weeks and was they possibly might have been engaged but not much happening most of this was they were not engaged or what was put in was not at the level it needed to be and so these students they did not feel they had the mastery level that was needed to help them be successful even with remediation at the next level so for the sake of the student it was best for them to repeat that grade level and so you'll see our retention levels were pretty low um, there was a lot of work done by the teachers to try their very best to contact these families work with them encourage them to get them in uh, by the end of the fourth six weeks a 
major portion of our TEKS or our curriculum is already covered because we have testing that starts coming up very soon thereafter. So a major portion of the TEKS are covered at that point and we go more into looking at remediation for those that did not uh, cover the material well, uh, spiraling back, doing practicing. Um, so um, there's never a good time to not be in class, but at the end of the school year is much better than what you experienced at Harvey, where you're at the beginning of the school year trying to kick it off from the beginning with the new learning. And then for the high school, you'll see that we had the, that since we used numerical grading, it was strictly passing or failing for credit for the course. And uh, they did quite well under the circumstances to ensure that these students were able to meet um, the standards we had set. And then uh, high school is having credit recovery this summer through Ingenuity. So we can try to keep them on track for graduation. Do have a question? <clears throat> and so do you have the high percentages? When we talked about our students not being in control and having to suffer because of district learning, that we didn't want to penalize them because of that. And I think that's the right perspective. But at the same time, as a board, I'd like to know, because of the high percentages of passing, was, was the grading dummy down for lack of a better word under the circumstances where we, we were a little bit more lax in, in the grading? Is, is, the, is, is the true passing, 98% of true passing grade, or is it because we relaxed our grading in those classes? Well, remember, you still had your first through fourth six weeks. and. Um, the fifth and sixth weeks, six weeks did not have as much work that was done because of just the nature of what we were doing. But when they turned whatever assignments were turned in, they had to still meet the standards. Okay. Yeah, you had made it clear that you know, you weren't giving as much work to be right. But the teachers still had certain things that they knew, knew that those students need to do and be able to do well. And so when they gave them the numerical grade, they were giving them the grade that they had achieved. Okay. Now that's not to say, I mean, I, we, and I want to stress that again, from everything that we have seen from across the state and the, and the slide that I had, had in the, when I did the calendar presentation, I've shown it here at the board meeting from TEA, when it talks about that summer slide and now we have the COVID slide. So no matter what we did, at what level it was, um, in every superintendent meeting I've had since we started this, we all agree our, every one of our students are going to come back in need of us giving them a jump start. Because you cannot miss this much instruction um, and do it, try to do it the way, the best that we all could without there being um, some consequences to this. But it has been out of our control and our job now is to ensure that we have the best plans in place so that when they do return to us or whatever mode that we have them that we are as prepared as possible to ensure that they get uh, they get we get them caught back up and did we have a rationale for the eighth grade being 57 percent promoted and only monitoring that's a large amount of monitoring also is there what was that kind of stands out over everyone else um, all the other grade levels did we just lose those kids completely well, as far I, as they quit turning in grade four, because I, I told the principals, you know, all of them, they didn't all have to be here due to the limited seating. I don't have Mr. King here to speak to that, but what I can do is get some detailed information for you and send that out in an email so that we can ensure that you know what the issues were, but I don't have that documentation in front of me at this moment. Because the promoting, again, that means they were good up to the fourth to six weeks and then they either didn't engage or didn't turn in paperwork. That's a large amount. To, I would say, again, I don't know how many eighth graders were in school, but right. even 20 to 30 people trying to catch up on something like that can be right. testing for the ninth grade teachers. To yes, yes. That but in all in all, when you look at retention and you look at what, be, what best practice is for retention, you need to always limit your retention. There needs to be very firm reasons for you retaining, especially at that level, because these children are growing quickly, just they're, you know, and they're developing uh, so you have to have very clear reasons why you would retain them at that level 
uh, if there is enough baseline to ensure that they can have uh, have remediation and support, uh, it's always better to try to do that. The lower levels, you know, pre-K, kinder, first, I, I wouldn't say pre-K, kinder, first, second, um, usually that's a good time that you're gonna do some retention because of that foundational piece. But once they start getting up at the higher levels, you know, we wanna try to not have those gaps. This time these gaps are coming out of, because of something out of our control, then what do we do to close it back up as quickly as possible? That's where that individualized learning and instruction is going to come, become very important as we move forward. Our college is going to have a hard job starting next year to get the kids back up to speed. It's going to be a very difficult job. It's going to be very task, task oriented for them. Yes. They'll be stressed out. It's, it's, we're, we're preparing for the best year we can, but yes, Mr. Clinic, you're probably correct. <laughs> <laughs> But if there's not any other questions on that, um, and we'll get some detail coming over to get some detailed information on the eighth grade percentages for that area, and I'll get that out to you in the email. Thank you. Welcome. The next piece is our summer food service. Um, we did opt to go ahead and do summer food service. We felt that was important uh, for our families, especially since we have so many that are um, unemployed right now um, and just suffering for various reasons. Our, our food service staff is, uh, has done a tremendous job. It's been very stressful and very trying uh, to pull off what they did during the spring, but they have a they, we are continuing that. Uh, you'll see that we're basically doing uh, the curbside grab and go, just like we did all during the spring. They will go to HT Falk to pick up their meals Monday through Thursday, since during the summer, Fridays, uh, our staff are off, so we work longer days on Monday through Thursday. 11:30 to 1. They started June 1st and will go through the end of June, uh, end of June to June 25th. Breakfast and lunch will be passed out each day to children one year uh, year old up to 18. We also have Be a Champion that is out there handing out snacks on a daily basis to support our families. Um, then we opted to not proceed into July because because we're going to be requesting here momentarily for us to start the school year earlier, we need the month of July one. I need my food service staff to have a moment to take a deep breath because they have not stopped since this started. And I need them to make sure that they're staying healthy and whole so that they can handle what will happen in August. And we also need time to have the turnaround for uh, preparing for fall. Um, and there's a lot to think about with that because we may not be able to serve meals as we've done in the past, so we're having to rethink and revamp, and that's going to take us some time to prepare in order to be uh, ready for the first. Any questions on that one? AP for Youth Summer Program. Um, you know, each year we've had them come in uh, to um, AC Blunt uh, and have their summer camp program. We were unsure they'd be able to have it this year, but uh, the governor did release where we could have summer camps, um, or that they, you know, so that any entity could have summer camps. Since they used our facilities, we met with them and ensured that they will be uh, following the guidelines that if we had summer school, that they still had to follow the TEA guidelines as well as the state guidelines and CDC guidelines. So we worked very closely with them to ensure that all safety protocols will be followed. We, uh, since we have vacated Key Burger uh, for the most part, we had the one wing as you go into the front of Key Burger and turn to the left going down towards the cafeteria. That whole wing, um, thanks to our wonderful maintenance staff and custodial staff, that we have, and uh, I have to give a shout out to Ms. Genovese for her work on the auction. Um, we got, um, uh, had the auction uh, and got that all closed out, got everything moved out. Of course, we had let uh, the AP for Youth go in and pick out tables and chairs and things that they could use. Uh, and instead of them being over at AC Blunt, we put them on that campus. That's helpful to them. It's also helpful to us because when they were on Blunt campus, it, we could not clean those classrooms until at the end of July, 1st of August. And so it really put a strain on our staff to be able to do that. and it. And, it kept our teachers from being able to get into their classrooms. 
So this way now they have their space and they know that they have that space as long as we can allow them to do it until we determine what we wish to do with that area next. Um, so it's been cleaned up. Uh, they've got it looking great and they will be holding summer camp in that building. Um, they um, are uh, going to have be a champion is going to help them with their food service all summer since they go all the way through the end of July. Um, so um, they will have the food there. I think they're only going to have 80 campers. Uh, that's what they limited it this year because they're going to have to do the social distancing and all of those protocols are in place. Um, so uh, we work, like I said, very closely with them to help uh, ensure that they will um, be set up and, and, and ha having safety measures uh, there. Um, they're very excited and very thankful uh, for uh, the use of that building uh, at this time. Uh, and we have our um, um, uh, agreements with them on what, what they can expect from us, what we expect from them uh, as they work in that building. Any questions on that one? Uh, are they going to be responsible for sanitizing it every day? Of the yes. Room? So, yes. Okay. yes. There, there's a, uh, all, all the things that are currently uh, on the TA website that are related to COVID-19 summer school, they're required to do those things to make sure that it's six feet apart, taking the temperature, uh, sanitizing, all of those uh, to ensure the safety of our children. But I know that we have many families that are very thankful for that opportunity because uh, those that are going back to work need, need some child care. And it also helps us with some of that remediation piece because then they're reading and they're having opportunities for some learning. Okay, the next piece, piece is uh, just talk to you about the fall planning. I put at your table uh, in front uh, the planning meeting agenda. So agendas, they're all saved in paper, so it's on front and back. I didn't I just, get one, it was good. Oh, I apologize. So I wanted you, did everyone else get one? Um, I wanted you to see um, where we started. We began today and we, you'll see that today was about logistics and safety. Um, and that's, um, we probably will sit there for a while trying to figure this out. We basically are having to think about fall and do not have all the regulations or rules yet. So we're having to base it off where we are right now, which is based off of if we brought, brought students back to school today or tomorrow, we would have to, um, on a bus that was transporting them, a 60 passenger bus would be down to 12 students that we would be able to put on that bus um, with the temperature taking, sanitizing, and so forth. If we then get them to school, then we need to have the intake into the classrooms and figure out how to maneuver them through to get, um, probably the best case scenario would be to take them all to one, uh, to a homeroom classroom and that's where they would stay all day uh, to prevent uh, the movement and, and, and coming in contact with others or find a way to do it very carefully. Um, each classroom would have to have um, 10, could have 10 students with one teacher and they all have to be six feet apart. Um, and then when we serve lunch, of course, you cannot have, we don't, none of our cafeterias are large enough that we can have the normal lunch schedules. So um, because of the flowing, uh, uh, the six feet apart, so the, you know, more than likely you would have to have uh, lunches boxed up, sack lunches taken down to the rooms. Then you have the whole sanitation during the day of how to sanitize the rooms, how to get the trash back out of the rooms after you feed the students. Um, then the restroom, monitoring when they go to the restroom, making sure they wash their hands thoroughly. Um, there's not a requirement to wear a mask. It's, a, it's um, suggested, but not a requirement for mask. Um, so you could have that, could, maybe not. Um, then, you know, we started our, even the summer program for athletics right now, and they're having to uh, stay when they're having any type of uh, activity. Then it is 30 feet apart, no, 10, 10, feet. 10 feet, I'm sorry, I was going to say that wasn't right and when I said it out of my mouth. <laughs> 10 feet apart now because of the activity, breathing harder and so forth. D 
disinfecting everything very carefully. Uh, so we are, we are attempting that like many other districts are so we can get our athletes and our other teams, uh, UIL competition teams so they can practice and so forth. But we're having to monitor that, disinfect, uh, and, and just work very carefully, once again, to protect our students and our staff. So that is a, just a quick summary of the current regulations that are on us for summer. And we have nothing to go on that that's going to be released. We are hoping and praying that it will be lessened so that we can have more students in a classroom and have not have all of those regulations because that the picture I just painted you logistically um, I'm not going to say it's impossible I would have said before this morning it was impossible because in my mind's eye I kept thinking there's just no way but this wonderful team that I have we sat here and we hashed it out and I wish you could have seen their faces when they were having a realization of what we could potentially be faced with but then they were sitting there and they were figuring it up and typing it and you know we thought okay we could, under those regulations, we could bring, I don't know how we get them here, uh, it, logistically moving the buses like that, that would be a very difficult, or almost impossible task. But once we got them here, we used every space, every room, every gym, every personnel, and even use, kind of borrowed from each other. Um, they felt like we probably could get everybody in a space. Now, that's not a, you know, the best scenario, and we want the best for our students. So where we, today, for day one, was basically looking at all those pieces, throwing out concerns, throwing out ideas, and then we left from today going, now, go talk to your other school friends, let's keep listening, we're gonna keep listening to the commissioner and the governor, and keep pulling together what we think will be the best way to proceed uh, when we get to August. Um, so I just wanted to share with you the very difficult task that all public schools are having right now as we think about how we're going to make this happen and we don't even have the rules yet. Are these mandations or recommendations uh, by the TEA? The uh, most of the ones I said are mandates. Are mandates. Mm -hmm. So is he, telling, is he going to make an announcement for this coming school year so we can plan for that? We or? are. We're hoping for that and feel like they're working on it. The governor, when he released the other things up to 50% is phase three. Um, TA has no um, comment on that yet. Uh, we're hoping tomorrow when we have our commissioner's uh, meeting that we'll hear that there's still something or at least they're working on it. Uh, they move, a, the lag time's a little behind on that. so. He says there's a task, or there is a task force that they work very closely trying to look at this. Uh, we've all been pushing as superintendents constantly, sending in our concerns, uh, saying we need to know now, earlier than later. We can't, you know, because he said, at one time he said July. Some school districts are starting school in the middle to end of July. And not to have, know even how to play the game until then it will be very difficult. So, but we don't have time to wait around because you know, people about to go off contract, um, they need to take a breather. Um, so we're trying our best to go ahead and think of every scenario, every possibility, uh, so that we can have school, get these kids back and teach them, but also protect everyone. So then tomorrow we're gonna get the full day, and this will be a big deep dive in the academic part, everything we were just talking about, how are we going to, uh, what, what's this going to look like? Uh, and I've talked to you before about how we might have some here, some at home. You know, there's so many different scenarios. So we're going to be working all of those and thinking how do we prepare and plan for whatever might be coming. And we want to get our teachers involved in this planning. So how do we do that with them being off contract now? Uh, there's just so many things to consider. So you see that whole list of items there that we are going to begin to discuss and work through. And then on the third day, we're going to jump off into technology. Um, and um, that's where, thankful, thankfully, you have um, approved us to be able to have the devices. But the devices are just that, they're tools. Without a plan and without a way of how we're going to use them so that we have the best for our students, um, 
they're just devices. So we're going to begin that process. Uh, and then you saw I had day four of anything, if we still have any brain cells left, and we have anything, I'm sure we're gonna, I, I feel like we're going to leave from these meetings with more questions than answers. Um, but I think we have to start there and then we can build off of that. So I just wanted you to see where we are in that planning. So you will hear more about that and hopefully we will have more direction. Believe in prayer, we will take it. <laughs> we need wisdom. And finally, I appreciate your time. Uh, I know that my, my reports have been a little longer lately, but there's so much going on and I only get to see you once a month to share this with you and I want to be able to answer your questions because my weekly updates cannot always convey all the work that's being done. Uh, budget workshop, we were looking at, um, you know, in the midst of all these new COVID things and basically rebuilding public education uh, while we're flying the plane, uh, we still have things that we normally do and one of them is preparing a budget and that is is scary in and of itself too because of all the moving parts of that. So um, been, uh, uh, Ms. Stansbury's already been working, pulling things together, looking at uh, any information we have, any templates. Uh, we have many uh, webinars and things that we're trying to prepare us for what could be coming, what it might look like. But what we'd like to do is have an opportunity to actually have just a meeting where we just talk to you about budget because there's so many moving parts with any normal budget that especially this year with COVID, um, we would like to be able to have a time set aside where we come together and it's a workshop and we share some information with you and you can really answer, ask some questions and we can do a little deep dive there uh, so that but when we get ready to come back at the regular board meeting August 10th, uh, we would have it firmed up, and then by August 24th, of course, we bring it to you for your approval. I just think that would be better than us just springing it on you and saying, okay, we're gonna, we need you to approve this thing. Um, I think, you know, this is where we really need to be a team and have an opportunity uh, for you to hear what we're thinking and why we're thinking that. Um, we looked at our calendars and in, in conjunction with um, uh, what our planning pieces, that we have going on. We were looking at July 27th, and so we wanted to see if that might work as a Monday. Um, and um, that would be, we felt like by then we should have enough information that we can share with you and answer uh, most of your questions, uh, if not all. So if you're able to let us know now, or if you don't know for sure, you can let us know um, maybe by tomorrow. So you could email me or email Ms. Miller and let us know. I'm good for 27. I'm good. You need to check your calendar. Are you good? Okay, you got it, you're good. <laughs> so what time would it take place? Well, uh, normally we meet for these things at seven, but I think you're the main one that has the conflict six or 6.30, which is better. Six o'clock. Okay. So let's say six o'clock on the 27th, and if that, if you get home and think, oh goodness, that's not going to work, let us know, and then via email, we'll try to set a new date. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. <coughs> I appreciate it. That is my report for this evening. Thank you. We move on to agenda item number six, which are the TASB priorities. Uh, Mr. Mullenack wanted to share this information with the board as an information item on the TASB Advocacy Committee's top priority items. I think there's nine of them. Yes, if, uh, we met back in March, I think, as a uh, legislative advisory council in uh, Region 2, and uh, we set our priorities there, and then TASB took, took all the 20 different regions and went through each one of those regions and had them give their top five or six priorities, and from that list, they developed the top nine priorities from that list. And June 19th, they're going to have a uh, legislative advisory council meeting number two uh, virtually, and that's where we're going to make any comments or any type of adjustments to it. But it's just for information out of view that uh, that's going to be right now probably the priorities that they're going to be looking at. It's going to be fighting the legislative part next, uh, next time they're in session. So, 
just information on them so you're aware of them. So if you have any comments on them, you can give them to me for the meeting and I'll express them. Okay. So you guys can email John if I'm any recommendations or want any other, other additional information? We'll move on to agenda item number seven, which are the financial reports. This is an information item. Uh, the first item is the accounts payable. Do you have any questions? If not, we'll move on to 7B, which is the budget status and investment report. Any questions from the board? Seven C is the tax collection report. Seven D is the bond finance report. Did you want Ms. Stansbury to report on any of this, Ms. Ms. Or we just information on it? I guess if you have any questions, we'll be glad to answer them. Ms. Stansbury, is there anything in particular you wanted to make to point out this evening? Um, I can find it. report basically is to show you the grand total or the, the ending cost of the projects that we've completed. Um, the first project, well the first page is a summary of all of the projects, the elementary school, the gym, and where we stand on the new concession stand. And behind that summary page is a page for each individual project. Um, I included the cost of construction, and with the Falk Elementary, we still owe a balance of $589,000 that we will be paying um, to the travelers. Their, their bond, they, they were bonded, and we're working with them now since they filed bankruptcy. Um, but I wanted to, to paint the picture of what actually the Falk Elementary actually did cost beyond uh, construction costs. Uh, the, the fees, architect fees, um, which totaled to be 913,000 for the elementary, and then the other expenses that were paid with bond funds, um, the, the internet wiring, uh, asbestos removal when we were getting ready to tear down the old block. All these costs uh, totaled up. Uh, so the total cost of the new elementary was $13,167,000. Um, the new high school gym, the same. I wanted, I pulled out the construction costs, added the fees that were associated, and then the other expenses of how we outfitted, what it took to outfit the new gym. Um, and the total cost of the new gym was the $4,753,000. And that project is 100% complete, um, punch list, everything, and we actually got to use it, so. And then the concession stand, um, the budget that we had originally set for a concession stand was $400,000. Uh, of course, as we all know, we're still working on that, and we paid to date fees, uh, which were architect fees and some other planning fees of the $35,000. And the last page is all the other projects, miscellaneous projects across the district that we've done um, and I try to itemize what was done. Mainly it's um, security, uh, new intercom systems, new phone systems, uh, communication, uh, major repairs at the high school, which was the tilt wall where we refinished the entire outside of the high school. Um, so with that being said, those miscellaneous pod projects added up to be the one million $16,810. Um, on the summary page, the very, uh, 
after the cover page. At the bottom of that page is the cash and investments. What we have in the checking account at this time is $305,496. And cash and logic is an investment pool where we have the balance of our bond money of the $1,967,000. Um, total available cash is $2,273. We have balances due, the $589,000 for the construction um, or for the elementary school, and then uh, the $341,000 that you approved to spend on new Chromebooks. Those being totaled, as far as I know, those are the only two things we still owe with bond money. So that gives you a million three hundred forty-two thousand dollars to put on. Uh, concession stand project or whatever your heart's desire. No. No. No, because I haven't transferred it yet. Um, Ms. Cook has reminded me that there's one piece that has not been added. We did receive the NEPA grant, um, and actually there's a budget amendment in here allowing us to actually transfer that money from our general fund back to the bond and we'll be adding another three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars to that one million three. So you're gonna have about one million six in bond funds that we can spend uh, on growth. So I have a couple of questions on, on the first one on the uh, new elementary school. I know the five eighty nine to ninety six was them going into bankruptcy. And this may be a question for Ms. Cook. Is have we been working with our <coughs> attorneys as far as collaborating with them in, in the decision to only pay this and making sure that we're covered? Okay. So we've got documentation for that as well. Okay. And then the other piece that you alluded to was all the moving pieces that we had for the project because we were spending bond money and then we were being reimbursed yes. later. Uh, I know one of the pieces was the furniture, the little elementary school. I believe we got grant money for that after we spent bond money. Yes, up front we spent the bond money. That was the uh, $263,000 for furniture and then playground equipment of $73,000. Uh, so basically the $313,000 that we'll be transferring will be offsetting that. It's, it's like a reimbursement. And that's and those are the available funds. That's what makes up that, those available funds. Yes, sir. Okay, just want to make sure. Anybody have any questions? I, I got a couple. You know, uh, state, uh, you know, as far as, as funding uh, at the end of the year when it gives us, you know, when it gives us money, the coronavirus is any impact on what they're going to give us? Do we know that? That's a moving piece that Ms. Cook alluded to. Um, we don't really know what we're going to get from the coronavirus. We were being led originally to believe that we were going to be getting some extra funding through federal funds, but cares, that will, ex thing? will explain in depth later. But um, in a meeting that I had about a week ago, the finance person from that used to work for TEA stated specifically that there is called ESSER funds, and it's a grant that we need to apply for. And it's not money on top of what we're supposed to be getting. It is going to make us whole. TEA, it's it's very complicated, but when TEA gets down to uh, figuring out what our ABA is supposed to be, or should have been and will be, they're going to do a, a, a calculation that reduces our ABA from what we're, we should have gotten to make us whole of what we budgeted. We're going to apply for the federal grant and get that money. They've already, it was 500,000, it was a little over half a million. Yeah. But they're deducting that from money that, they're going to get. that we should have already earned, but they're taking it away because they know this federal money is coming in. So, so the CARES Act is not going to be money to get extra money, it's going to be money that the state's going to be deducted from our budget. Whole, just to so we're not, get, we're not going to get extra money from the federal government, it's just going to, I mean, we've been doing this for years. The state does that all the time. Well, the, the, the federal government gives them money, the state takes it back. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Are there any other questions on the bond update? If there are no questions, Thank we'll you. move on to the COVID-19 expenses. And there is a document that's loaded in workbook that gives you an itemization. And it looks to date, just for public information, COVID-19 cost of operations as of May 31st, 2020. Total cost of supplies, $40,470.66. Payroll overtime only, $32,849.24. Total COVID expenses, $73,319.90. So it hasn't been an expensive one at all. I don't know if you want to add to that. No, it is what it is. Are there any questions for Ms. Cook on the uh, COVID-19 update? I think you heard your answer on that one going to be reversed. If there are no questions, we'll move on to an information item. Agenda item number eight is the consent agenda. It's an item to uh, consider and approve the minutes of the May 11, 2020 regular board meeting and the minutes of the May 18, 2020 special board meeting. Are there any corrections? Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you for the uh, compliance for the application for 30 years instead of 30 days. Okay. Let me do fix that. Okay. That's all I'm going to That's all I'm So if there's, if it's been corrected, we don't need to have a correction. So you have a motion to approve the minutes of the May 11th River Board meeting and the minutes of the May 18th special call meeting? So moved. Have a motion by Mr. Stansberry is second by Mr. Next. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved. Next item is to consider and approve the revisions to the 2020-21 calendar. Let's go. Good. Um, as I stated earlier, um, we had to, actually I shared with you and I did a video out to all the staff um, sharing how the commissioner came to us um, encouraging everyone to go to a intercessional calendar it's more or less a almost a year-round calendar with breaks built into this to time where you would start about the first of august go to the end of june at least and have bigger breaks in between that time the thinking is to help with remediation, uh, help with um, if we have to have school closures due to COVID outbreaks, potentially in the winter. Um, and so we took that calendar and there were lots of options and, and encouragement, looking at different things. So I took it to the team, we looked at it, we thought about it from every standpoint, especially what our community needs are and what that would do to our families to have to try to find childcare during intercession times. And, um, and then would you really, you know, will your breaks be placed at the right time for, because we don't have a crystal ball when the outbreak could eventually occur. So after much consideration, we came back to our traditional calendar and uh, basically felt like we needed more time with our students. Uh, if we're going to remediate with them, we need them more. Uh, and so we only had 169 days in the for the calendar we brought to you earlier in the spring. This one has 180 days with students in the classroom, hopefully in the classroom. Um, and um, this also, since we work off of instead of days on how we're funded, uh, you know, remember it's minutes. We have to have 75,600 minutes. So you'll see with this calendar, not my glasses on, it was 80 something. It was, uh, 80 1,420 minutes. So that is quite a bit of minutes that we can more or less bank, I would say. So we have that extra time to use for uh, closures, other needs. So we have, we have overage there that could be used at any time that we deemed was appropriate to meet whatever need there might be. Um, so we felt like this was more family friendly one because it brings our students in 
It provides the support that we need. Uh, it doesn't cause our families to have to have these constant times of, of large amounts of time to try to find child care for their children. Um, the, uh, it does remove the way we got those days was basically, uh, as you see, it's starting earlier. Uh, teachers would come back on August 3rd for one week of in-service. <laughs> so we removed one uh, week of, we normally had two weeks of in-service before school started, so they will only have one. Um, and then the students would come back on the 10th and then the end the professional development work days that we had originally put throughout the school year we removed those where they only have one at the end of each semester that is one of the drawbacks to this calendar is that we remove the um, teacher days for that planning and support that we truly believe in but when we weighed our options uh, of what needs to be done for this year, and we we're hoping this is just this year's calendar because it's, it's not the way we would like it to look, but for the needs we have due to COVID, we feel like the time with the students is very valuable. So we are bringing this to you tonight uh, with that uh, revision um, to an earlier start date. This does enact our District of Innovation where we start before the fourth Monday of the um, um, of August. Uh, so we do have that in place. You already approved us to have that ability to start earlier. Uh, so this does move us into doing that. Uh, and then to help recoup the time that we need for our teachers in planning. That's one of the things you'll notice on that fall planning sheet we'll be talking tomorrow about how do we schedule for common planning time during the day for our teachers and what other creative ways can we find to support our teachers in ensuring that they have um, what they need to, to meet the challenges that we are going to have in the stressful situations. Uh, another blessing that we have that when you approved us to do this, we had no idea this was coming. But if you remember when we started our Panther Pathway and we talked about having coaching for our teachers through Engage to Learn, we will, they will have real-time coaching coming in um, to help them in their classrooms and help them uh, on in-house in and virtually. So uh, they will have, uh, we already have some built-in support pieces and we're gonna continue to look at that. Uh, I was concerned when I sent it out to the teachers that they may uh, really have a problem with because I knew that was the thing they were going to see is that they lost those built-in planning days that we put them back to student days but as always our teachers they just say we will do whatever uh, we had them respond to us uh, and let us know uh, concerns ideas and every comment we got was positive it was let's do it we, it, this, is, this is what we need to do. Some, several said we are so thankful we're not doing the intercessional calendar where we go to the end of June. I, I don't think that would have went over well here. Um, we would have had to horrible attendance because you know people are used to getting having their summer vacations and so forth in June. Um, but um, and they, they were and just offering to you know if you need us to come in this summer and do anything, whatever we can do, uh, we're ready to do it. Uh, so I just want to say kudos to our, our staff um, and how they're willing to do truly whatever it takes uh, in this very trying time. So tonight, with all that said, um, we um, have vetted it with our teachers that would have affected them mostly. Uh, we bring it to you tonight. I did send it out to our DIC committee, had them have, provide input, input per policy, uh, received nothing but positive comments, uh, and then um, if you approve this tonight, then we will uh, begin tomorrow pushing this out to our parents uh, about why we did this. And um, I, from what we're hearing from most parents, I think they're, they would tell us to take the kids now because <laughs> it's been a long, uh, long, I already feel like they had summer. <laughs> so uh, it's been tough. And those that are trying to go back to work, it's been very difficult. Um, so with that said, um, if you have any questions, um, I'll be glad to answer them. Can you just elaborate on what ADSY is? I'm supposed to probably already know that, but- Oh yes, I'm sorry. a month in June? Yes, I apologize. That's fine. 
with with that, um, with us going to 180 days now for student days, um, there was legislation passed that every day, at, if you go up to 180 days, every day after that, up to 30 days, you can be half funded half day for uh, extended uh, remediation, enrichment, anything like that uh, with our kindergarten through, or maybe pre-K, pre-K through fifth grade. I, sometimes all these numbers get mixed up by it. Pre-K through fifth grade. So this will calendar also comes with some extra funding. That wasn't our main objective for doing it. It's just kind of a little extra side note once we made this decision that we can take advantage now of that extra funding and help us pay for extended uh, time with students that are in need uh, next summer. So we can continue that to closing that gap. And then we could use uh, uh, look at our other funding, our local funding, if we wanted to do it through, have our six, say our middle school come in, or, you know, of course we already do credit recovery for high school. So it gives us an opportunity to do more uh, because we'll get some extra funding. Thank you. Does the board have any questions on the uh, proposed calendar? Uh, I, got, I got one. How to, how to compare with other district calendars? Since we have, are we still going to have, uh, you know, uh, them bringing nurse people over here, us doing well in classes, uh, and that, and how does it compare with the district's calendars as far as that, as far as those kids are Well, um, the uh, the area counts, districts that we work with, they're all we're all right within each other. We will be starting earlier than they are, but they're starting like we're starting on the tenth. Some are starting on the twelfth. Some are starting. Let's see, where was the first day? Let me get back up to August. Um, some were starting, we're starting the students on the 10th, there was one that's starting on the 12th, one that's starting on the 17th, which is the next Monday. So we're within a week, week and a Most half of each other. Right. Holidays are falling, pretty much similar. Um, and as far as how that's going to work, that's still a huge... Um, and we're still gonna have that available for them? I do not that, know that. I, yeah. That's part of this planning, and that's part of how the COVID, what COVID will, how that will be, whether the districts whether we how if we can make that work to share students under yeah. certain restrictions, we will be doing everything we can to try to ensure it happens. But um, I don't have the answer to that yet. That's part of that that planning piece. Thank you. Does that affect our ability? Well, yes, if they don't come, we would not charge them. Just like if we don't go to their district, they wouldn't charge us, yes. So that'll be part of the uh, workshop that we're discussing? Um, budget. Hopefully, okay. we'll have some answers to that by then. Okay. Yes, okay. I, I can't guarantee that because I don't know what information we'll have at that no, point. I hope and pray. I, oh, definitely. Yes, every penny's on our radar right now. <laughs> And that they live in the RTC since a lot of the kids they have a, a they, I think they have a minimum number they have to have in the RTC program to maintain it and a lot of those are coming from outside districts so we may not have enough kids in our district well that could but I really don't think it's going to that is going to happen to that where we can't do it we're just going to have to have very clear um, understandings between the districts more so than we ever have of what we can do how we're going to bus them uh, because you saw how the transportation piece is already a huge yeah. issue. We're still trying to figure out how to get all the kids here, and then, and then we've got to get kids back and forth to campuses. So I'm not saying it can't be done. I just don't know how it's going to look. But we're, you know, I, I, I don't want to say here we're going to definitely make sure it happens. We're going to do everything we can to make sure it happens. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a motion to approve the revised 2020-21 calendar as recommended by administration. A motion by Ms. Diasis and a second by Mr. Mullahack. In favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved. Agenda item 9B is to consider and approve the missed school day waiver application. Okay, the next three are going to be, um, if it's okay, I'll just go ahead and share with you about it because they're all part of the COVID 19 waiver. Um, agenda <laughs> there's like you know i've already brought i think three or four to you last month um so here's three more the first one is the miss school day waiver this helps us ensure that we get our funding this is we had to wait until after the last day of our instruction and basically this waiver and attestation shows that 
We did planning March 17th through the 20th is when the teachers were planning for the instruction. And then beginning on March 23rd until March 28th, uh, we had our um, instruction that occurred. So this waiver basically is saying that we did uh, distance learning um, and made sure that uh, we had the instruction. This is you putting that in so that I can submit it so we can ensure we get funded. So that's basically uh, one of the waivers that were created, created due to COVID. Um, any questions on that one? If not, I'll go to the next one. Uh, the next one is the K and 7th reading instruments. Um, due to the fact that we haven't been in school and there's some certain legislation or, or requirements that were out there, um, and this was one of them looking at uh, moving to some new instruments, but due to the fact that we have all these other issues that we're having to deal with, this TEA, we're thankful, has given that as an option to not move to trying to figure out those new instruments or use those new instruments at this time. We can use what we currently are using and then phase into that. Did I say that right? Okay. Shelly had to coach me on that one. <laughs> so, um, so basically we'll have another year, I guess we have all next year now, to make that decision so we don't have to rush into it. So that's just, uh, um, we have to do these waivers because if it was a, um, a mandate, uh, that by a certain time you do something, the only way to get around that is you have to have some documentation and put in, so they're creating these waivers. And the last one is uh, to look at um, the parent notice that's required for fourth and seventh grade students that are at risk of failure the next year. This one is based off of their STAR performance. Well, we didn't have STAR, and so we have uh, you know, uh, we, as you saw by the report we gave earlier, we have contacted parents that we feel are at risk of and need remediation, but not based off of this, um, this piece that's required. So what we're looking at and be investigating is how we're going when the students come back. Um, the state's even creating some uh, pre-assessments, kind of like in the STAR format that we could use when they come back so we can assess where they are, determine who's at risk, and then we will contact the parents and make sure. So that's what this is giving us more time to get more information. At this point, we, we don't have that data to, to use to inform the parents. So the state realized that and gave us a way to, um, to go around it for now. So all of these things will, will one helps with funding, one helps gives us, and the other two just give us more time to make sure we do the, meet those requirements in the proper way. Any questions from the board? If there are no questions, I'm going to combine these three. Do I have a motion to approve approve the Miss School Day waiver application. The alternative K and seventh grade reading instrument requirement waiver and the waiver for per parent notice requirements for students at risk of failure. So moved. I have a motion by this director, a second by Mr. Stansbury. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motions approved. Next item is 9E to consider and approve the application to TTA for the 2021 optional flexible school day program. Yes, uh, Mr. O'Brien will come up now and give you the report that he gives each year on this program so that uh, before you approve this uh, uh, moving forward, you'll know how we fared this year. Mr. O'Brien. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, Talking about the uh, optional flexible school day program, and this year we had seven students participate in the program. Of course, we had a, a, an odd year. <coughs> we had four seniors and three underclassmen, and of those students that were in the program, uh, we had no dropouts. We had one student withdraw and uh, moved to another district, and that was before the COVID uh, virus, and then we had three seniors graduate from the program. That's a success. Um, uh, the optional flexible school day program, uh, as you may or may not know, we they come a total of five hours a week, basically, and we offer flexible scheduling for those. And it's for students who are uh, who have dropped out of school, who are or, or are at risk of dropping out of school, and that can be anyone in the district. We primarily serve high school students in this program. Um, we did a total of 571 hours and 34, or 34,238 minutes, which is actually an increase of what we had last year with more students. So, um, 
various reasons for getting into the program. A student can't just go and say, I want to go into the OFSD program. They have to have significant reasons for getting in there. It does help some students, though. It really does. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer those. We have to apply for the we have to apply for the program every year, and so we used to have to have a public meeting. This is just a, an informational meeting uh, item for you guys now. Do we have any questions? This has been an ongoing program that the district has, has had, so I think it's great in reaching these kids that are at, at risk. So I don't have any questions. There are no questions. Do I have a motion to approve the application to TA for the 2021 20, optional flexible school day program? As recommended by administration. So moved. I have a motion by Ms. Diaz. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Rolinak. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motions approved. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Next item is 9F to consider and approve the proposal for grant study by urban engineering. Okay, we're trying to get back to some of those items we were working on before this all happened. <laughs> so we're trying to move that back around. So uh, if you remember, um, we had, uh, you had a committee, we went and looked at what uh, options we might have and we determined that before we could really move forward with any option, we had to take a look at the drainage situation. This is for the concession stand uh, for under the bond uh, piece. So, um, because we have drainage issues out there. So we had um, urban engineering come out uh, and look at what that could potentially look like. Um, uh, and um, so it's, it's a process. So uh, actually March 4th, right before we got out for spring break is when they had, were putting together the proposal. Then we came back and you know, we, we were not been able to look at this. It was on my mind, but it just didn't get done. Um, so I did. Con I had Todd contact him, them to make sure this March 4th um, proposal was still valid, and they said yes, they would go with these numbers. And so if you looked at it, they basically, when they came out, they went ahead and looked at the scope of services uh, for, uh, for two different, where they look at the survey and then the drainage actual plan or study. Um, and when they were here, they talked to us about our whole area out there. So they gave us op three options, and you saw that on the map where, um, you know, because we have some drainage pieces or issues in several areas. So option one is uh, really what I'm bringing to you tonight, unless you prefer to do more. But I think right now, uh, from our standpoint as administration, we feel like option one, if you look at the map, has the entire football, so it has the stadium, the tennis courts, uh, so basically from Demery Lane down um, um, Victory Lane over to McMullen, uh, and then takes in our Panther Pond um, that we have, uh, and then comes back up the back side of the new gym. And that's really the area that we were focused in on for the, uh, we need to understand how, what kind of drainage issues do we have, and what are some potential um, ways to correct it and to work with it before we uh, start. So, because even to put pavement, you know, we've talked about the county coming out paving the red so we have more uh, um, parking by the stadium. Well, even with that, we need to know what's going to happen because once you start moving any dirt or putting anything down, you know what happens. That water that used to drain through there has got to drain somehow so we don't want to tear something else up. So tonight, I'm bringing to you the proposal to uh, go with option one for both of those phases. I think it came out to a amount of, let me go, a clip back, where is that now? Uh-oh. I'm still trying to learn how to maneuver this. So for task one, uh, to do the survey, it's uh, for option one, area one, it's 15,000. And then the drainage study is 14500 And in the report, you see what all they would do. So in, in order to move forward and get this done, um, we need your approval to move forward. And this would be used out of the, port, out of the bond funds. One thing I'd like to add is I think Mr. Stansbury had a, a good perspective of the last meeting that we talked about this and the fact that when we years ago when they built a high school and purchased this property here, there wasn't really a drainage that put into place. We just, we piecemealed and grown, as most districts do, but now we're really invested in, in this study uh, going forward to what we're doing now. I mean, we're basically 
pay for what we didn't do previously. So, I mean, I, I think it's a good investment for us to uh, to make in what we're planning to do in the future. And I think we have to have it. If, it's, if not, we're going to have a, a lot of mess going on with our construction. So, There's a lot going on with the city and the county with the development of the Hogan homes and all the drainage problems they're having from that development. Are they going to correlate with what's going on around us to to make sure what we do doesn't make it worse or what they're doing isn't going to sabotage their plans right. to try to correct ours? I've not asked that question specifically, but I can. Okay. I can There's I a lot of table in the city. Let's county. make sure we're all working together so we all it all flows well. Yeah, it's a it's big, it's a big issue um, yes. on this thing, in this area for the neighbors. So yes. I'd hate for us to have a great plan and spend a lot of money on a survey if they're not talking to the other entities. Okay, that's a good idea. Are there any other questions, comments? If there are none, do you have a motion to approve the proposal for training study by Urban Engineering as recommended by administration? Second. I have a motion by Mr. Stansbury, a second by Mr. Director. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved. 9G is to consider and approve the budget amendment. Included in your board book is the budget amendment from Ms. Stansbury's office. APIC was awarded a NIFA grant, new instructional facility allotment, which reimburses the district. For equipping a new instructional facility, the district used bond funds to pay for furniture and playground equipment. We are reimbursing our bond funds. Any questions? The dollar amount is three hundred fifteen thousand dollars. There are no questions. I have a motion to approve the budget amendment. I have a motion by Mr. Diosa. Do a second? Second. Second by Mr. Molinak. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion to approve. This to agenda item number 10, which is discussion. It's time to set, set aside for any board member to address any topics for future meetings. Anybody have anything? Move on to agenda item 11, which is to convene an executive session as authorized by the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code 551.001 concerning any and all purposes permitted by the Act. Section 551.074, discussing personnel, resignations, retires, and contract renewals. The time is now 8.22, and we'll convene the executive session. Well, the time is now 8.39, and the board has reconvened an open session to act on any items requiring action from closed session. We have a motion to approve the resignation and contract renewal as recommended by administration. Motion by Mr. Stansbury, second by Ms. Diasis. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion is approved.